All right, so I do not want to thank the organizers. <laughs> I, I want to get adopted by the organizers. Move here and have you love me the way that you have loved on us since we've arrived. What fantastic hospitality. Um, we're deeply appreciative. So, see you again. Uh, je suis Joshua. And um, I'm going to launch in. The citizenship bestowed on Native peoples in 1924 with the ICA was in many places doled out uh, on an installment plan, as many Native people could have testified 20 years prior, um, with restrictions on voting, marriage partners, fiscal management, via competence claims, and the like, as David and Phil have reminded us. When Oklahoma became a state, I argue it got a taste of how second-class citizenship felt as it sent small-town politicians to Washington, D.C. Frederick Nietzsche wrote that after an existential crisis, you, uh, once you've, you've seen into the absurd life of things, you get two options. You experience either horror or nausea. That's it. <laughs> um, so something to look forward to, Keith. Um, but from that, you yield perhaps tragedy in the sublime um, or, uh, sorry, tr uh, yeah, tragedy in the sublime taming of the horrible or comedy with the discharge of the absurd. So uh, one of these small town fellas that Oklahoma sends to DC is Alfalfa Bill Murray. Um, <laughs> We'll talk about Alfalfa Bill. That's him on your left, of course. The same year, 1924, um, Cherokee media giant Will Rogers, there on the right, made three comedic films for producer Hal Roach about a character named Alfalfa, Doolittle, a local bumpkin, and eventual U.S. Senator. So I can't prove it, <laughs> but come on. Um, Roger's sly contempt for pandering, hypocritical, and ineffectual politicians relies on a deeper recognition of, what else, the inherent absurdity in belonging to a political body, legislative or national, at least as interested in surface as it is in substance. In this qualified light, then, citizenship in, emerges as less a bestowal of sublime national belonging than as a partial manipulative strategy to protect the nation's image and resources, um, and as then a gift of dubious value. Christina Stanchu argues that extending citizenship to natives serve the immediate PR needs of the Department of Indian Affairs by casting the inclusion uh, as a gift bestowed on native peoples. Among those needs, I'd suggest, it was justifying the legal theft of native lands via the Dawes Act and the plenary power doctrine that Keith described for us. These are under contention in 1924, right? The federal government's reputation for fulfilling its trust responsibility was taking a beating in the press with the Osage oil murders uh, as the Merriam report investigations were kind of consolidating and getting underway. Thank you, Celine and Ned, and a big nod to Daniel for the work on Gertrude Bonin that I didn't know about, this killer. So the ICA rolled out during a time of widespread nativist populism. Uh, anti-immigrant and isolationist patriotism and invoked a narrative of exceptionalism that needed to stand up to some historical scrutiny. Rogers didn't see it, <laughs> he was just not having it, and in 1924 sardonically juxtaposed the cant of the nationalists with their actual motives. So this is uh, from an essay in 24, quote, I hear the Navajos have struck oil on their reservation. That will give the white man a chance to show his so-called 100% Americanism by flocking in and taking it away from the Indians. It's just vicious at times, this guy. Uh, that 100% Americanism shows up, and, and we've heard traces of it uh, kind of throughout uh, the couple of days. He might well have contemplated the motives that led to Oklahoma statehood in 1907, and that just 10 years after the Nellie Johnson became the first successful oil well in 1897 when he remarked, we spoiled the best territory in the world to make a state. So we see in citizenship a right, yes, but historically we also see in it a manipulated token. Its powers meted out by peace, partial in terms of race, representation, and actual influence. At least as much as it confers recognition, it bargains for resources. 
in Oklahoma, it was the currency for land, oil, and lives. Will Rogers was a giant of stage, print, radio, film uh, from the early 1920s until his death at age 55 in 1935, coming from a prominent Cherokee family in Indian Territory. His father, Clem, was a judge and a senator in the Cherokee Nation who served on the Oklahoma Constitutional Convention, along with that convention's president, Alpha Alpha Bill Murray. In 1924 was a banner year for Rogers. Um, he was moving out of the Zigfield Follies uh, into movies. He finally, in his life, appeared in 68, 47 of them silent. He was staking out a claim as a newspaper colonist, which made him the preeminent humorist and political commentator of his day via the novel syndication distribution model. Right, so syndication is new to us, in essence, uh, in the early 1920s, and he's right on the cutting edge of it. The same year, the first collection of his weekly articles were collected as the Illiterate Digest. The graft of the Teapot Dome scandal and the completely foobarred Democratic National Convention of 1924 dominate the topics. Hundred and some odd ballots before they land on a candidate for president. As far as I can tell, Rogers made no mention of the ICA, although he was probably the preeminent uh, national commentator of the day on what it meant to be a U.S. citizen. It's hard to make much of his incessant jabs at Congress, which never amount to an action plan, although their nonstop targeting of performative hypocrisy shapes a mistrust bordering on the anarchic. Knowing something of how acting gets critiqued, he takes Congress about as seriously as people took his films. I'm quoting from the Illiterate Digest. Now, you take the Capitol at Washington. I can't do the voice, um, but I'm, I've got a little bit of an inflection there. Anyway, um, you take the Capitol at Washington. That's the biggest studio in the world. We call ours pictures when they're turned out. They call theirs laws or bills. It's all the same thing. Girls win a little state popularity contest that is conducted by some newspaper. Then they're put into the movies to entertain 110 million people who they never saw or know nothing about. Now, that's the same way with the Capitol Comedy Company of Washington. They win a state popularity contest backed by a newspaper and are sent to Washington to turn out laws for 100 million people they never saw. In his broad commentary on American civic life, Rogers' works, literary and cinematic, return us to theatrical performance, a kind of pre-Butlerian performance model, um, where performed citizenship that uh, Jim and Stanchu have drawn our attention to, Christina this, sorry, giving us the first taste of that kind of regional voice, that local inflection that Joanna was reminding us of, especially via radio. Yeah. So Roger Sr., by some 12 years, Alfalfa Bill Murray, Jiminy Christmas, that guy, um, was born in Toad Suck, Texas. <laughs> it's so funny to say. <laughs> you can't make it up. Um, he worked as a farmhand and a school teacher before getting involved in farmers' politics, the Farmers' Alliance. He became an attorney and migrated to the Chickasaw Nation where he married into some prominence and the wealth of four allotments in 1899. Reminded of Jim Welch, right? Married 80 acres. <laughs> um, Mary Alice Harrell was the niece of the Chickasaw's governor. There he is in a PR photo. This is a PR photo for the guy. Um, <laughs> He was a niece of Chickasaw's governor uh, who put his, uh, so the governor then put his nephew-in-law to work advising the tribe, representing it at the native state of Sequoia and the Oklahoma uh, Constitutional Conventions. Intermarried white citizens were very much an identity category, recognized by several native nations in Oklahoma, which provided them a means then of including outsiders in the fold, right? Um, and eventually maybe making a little bit of headway um, in state politics. Murray was apparently able to overcome both the social stigma of marrying a native woman and his own dramatic avowed racism, uh, which was consistently anti-black, um, although he in later life became also robustly anti-Semitic. Um, the guy, right? So he was elected the first speaker of the state's House of Representatives and graduated to the U.S. House uh, from 1913 to 1917. 
He was then governor in the early 1930s. That one term was a doozy. Uh, in those four short years, he set a state record for the most times a governor has declared martial law in Oklahoma, and for the most times for calling out the uh, National Guard to enforce his policies, like keeping a toll road open across the Red River and uh, shutting down oil production to drive up prices. Bat shit crazy. Um, Although his bid for U.S. president on the, quote, bread, butter, bacon, and beans platform in 1932 went nowhere slow, and his political career uh, petered out after leaving office in 1935, voters would not hold his extravagance against him. Um, they wound up uh, naming Murray County, Lake Murray, and Murray State College um, after him. He swore in his son, um, Johnson, as governor in 1950. Between his unremarkable stint in the U.S. Congress and his triumphant return to the Oklahoma governorship, Murray became so embittered at the flashy trappings of modernity and the, quote, centralized and despotic power, I don't know if that's what he sounded like, it was probably worse, um, in the states, uh, the United States, that he packed up his family and several more, some 70 to 80 souls in all, and took them down to Bolivia on May 4th, 1924. He aimed to set up a utopian colony based on his vision of a whites-only society, not counting native wives, founded on cooperation and mutual helpfulness. And the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. They're in the bylaws. Um, these protections presumably did not extend to the local natives who were used for, in his words, hard and, un hard and common labor and very cheap. The founders had to be of sufficient means to buy into the project and could have no trace of criminal blood. <laughs> the bylaws also provided that Murray himself got to sign off on practically everything, including who was assigned, like which parcel of land, all kinds of stuff. So, upset with centralized despotic power, he sets himself up as a despot. Yeah. Imagining himself this kind of benevolent dictator, the project was an utter catastrophe. The family's belongings were significantly delayed after they were picked over by thieves on the dock. They were met with colonies of wasps in the buildings that they took over, which they did not build. They took over from the natives and folks uh, who were already there. Grasshoppers ate their first crop. <laughs> Um, the families who didn't drift away early on uh, from this tropical nightmare found themselves increasingly fond of chewing coca leaves and increasingly less fond of one another. <laughs> they just got to where they despise being around each other. Um, so for his many errors, none glare so astoundingly as Murray's failure to secure actual title to the land from the Bolivian government. He leased it. It was in fact owned by priests and local natives. Finally, after a variety of calamities, he lost his, the support that he had among the Bolivian authorities, and they bowed to the landholder's occupancy rights claim and canceled his lease in August of 1928, and he had to borrow money to get himself and his family back home. And then got elected governor two years later. Is it, is it nausea or horror that you feel? I, I don't know. <laughs> So, uh, Murray's Bolivian ignominy came around too late for Roger's discharge of Alfalfa <laughs> in a performance comically portraying like big man political citizenship that showed mainstream Americans treating Okies the way that Okies treated Indians. The producer of the films, Hal Roach, uh, later a studio head, created the Our Gang, Little Rascals Folks, uh, Laurel and Hardy films, um, but he's very early in his career here. The first and second in the Rogers series, Going to Congress, and Our Congressman, were directed by Rob Wagner, with Rogers picking up a co-writing credit. Uh, the last film was directed by Hampton Del Ruth, and Rogers must have written some of it, but he didn't get a credit. All in, these three films didn't do much for Roach, losing over 80000 um, bucks. But he made a raft of films with Roach that made plenty of money. So don't worry about Will, he's fine. In going to Congress, Rogers introduced the character of Alfalfa Doolittle. Um, that's not Alfalfa. We'll come back to him, sorry. Um, 
who was first a senator, then an ambassador. He was revised as Bill Doolittle in 1931, a full-length talkie that Rogers made later. Uh, the film opens on a smoke-filled room, that's a smoke-filled room, uh, with local political operatives, operatives trying to land on a candidate they can float in the next election after a scandal-filled year, which audiences would have understood as a clear reference to the widespread Teapot Dome investigations into insider oil trading. Their candidate, Alfalfa Doolittle, has a reputation as a shiftless cracker barrel, actually sort of a prune crate philosopher, uh, <laughs> whose smart-ass remarks make up in pithiness what they lack in practicality. That Doolittle's naivete, laziness, and barely concealed stupidity are the qualities that most commend him as a congressman <laughs> is the clearest punchline, as summed up in his shoe cobbler's advice that he takes to heart, and that is, do nothing and you will go far and last long. The film indicates the hypocrisy of the party bosses manipulating this political theater, the gullibility of the, quote, below normal Americans <laughs> willing to put their trust and political futures in the hands of a hayseed who wins his election on the promise of no less than bringing rain. <laughs> this is what the farmers need. So that's what he's going to do. Um, and there's even a jab here at Robert Rogers own public persona, which closely resembles Doolittle's wisecracking bumbler. Had Rogers not been on guard, he would have probably found himself standing for election for some office. And in fact, he was nominated, in some jest, for president in the 1924 Democratic National Convention. At the 1932 Democratic Convention, then Oklahoma Governor Alfalfa Bill Murray pledged uh, Oklahoma's votes to Rogers again, before shifting them to Franklin Roosevelt. Rogers, who was in attendance, was reportedly greatly amused once somebody woke him up to tell him about it. <laughs> so, um, throughout these films, there's a, or the last film, there's a little bit of political satire on like anarchist assassination of monarchs that I'll just have to skip. Talk to me about it later. So, as with much of Rogers' humor, the up to minuteness consigns it to historical obscurity, but its discernment of the cynical ploys of shameless campaign tactics remains razor sharp. I note the disabled military veterans with their prominent limps leading the candidate's entry into town before he delivers the down home folk speech. Of all the publicity-minded concerns with appearances, costuming is central to all these three films. Both within the narrative and for my critical approach to them, appearing as they do in the dawning decades of newspaper photography. And, of course, silent film itself, right? So that is to say, costume indexes the burgeoning public image machine, with which Rogers was fascinated. And as a crucial cinematic tactic, it tells us how to relate to characters in terms of class, in terms of stature, geographic origin, conformity, rebelliousness, gender, race, among many other identity elements. It's a shorthand, right? The hats alone could probably tell us this much, as Doolittle points out in a title card during a campaign speech, saying, now you don't see me coming here in any long barrel coat and stovepipe hat, do you? No. Instead, an unstructured jacket, slouchy, he removes his removable collar uh, into his pocket to establish his bona fides with and to pander to rural voters. He's so common, he tells the crowd, he don't even wear socks, <laughs> just like them. <laughs> the folks gathered around in their bowlers, fedoras, bonnets, and page boy hats. He contrasts not only his uh, opponent, who is sporting a formal necktie and wingtip collar, three-piece suit, but also the political party bosses from both parties who are even more duded up in top hats, tails, and bow ties. Doolittle's own hat is a cross between a cowboy and a fedora. It's a kind of urban-rural hybrid with a stockman's brim worn at an insouciant tilt. Critically for him, it's crumpleable so that he can worry it and roll it around during speeches delivered in a language that everyone speaks, right? He's talking to everyone. The hat does the same thing with signature insecurity and precision artlessness, right? 
After he's elected, the film devotes an entire three-minute scene, about a tenth of the film, to a physical comedy gag around costume. As Doodle's family persuades him to swap his rumpled coat and hat for the top hat and tails of the establishment, and he vies with his suspenders and his string tie to get tied. There's this whole sort of Buster Keaton-esque shenanigans, right, that he's, he's trying to get together. Having learned nothing besides how to look like an important man, he's ready to be one in Our Congressman, the second film, where he tries to avoid eating his collar. <laughs> it sort of rises up on him. And in A Truthful Liar, where there's the collar. Yeah. Um, a Truthful Liar, where he's sporting these outlandish golf outfits. This is the visual gag. So the fish out of water costuming wraps up with Ambassador Bill presenting himself to the king of the fake country cornucopia while hiding under a full-length Dracula cape. Underneath, he, who's more Rogers than Alfalfa at this point, conceals his traditional Western garb. Chaps, lasso, whole thing, right? So, um, he whips this off to kind of emerge in his familiar cowboy glory, a democratized reversal of Clark Kent busting out as Superman here, right? We've been waiting to see Will all these three films. So, costume, like politics, is first and foremost about appearances. And the sage of, uh, and this was known, I think, both to uh, Will Rogers and to Alfalfa Bill, the politician, um, who is known as the sage of Tishomingo. He regularly used his outfit to firm up his image, retorting to a newspaper's criticism. Is he who wears an $8 pair of waterproof boots and a $5 Stetson hat not an average man and well-dressed? I like the Indian Territory Union because it has no dude members. But I've got a shot of him in a white suit. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> right, but that's later in his life. The newspaper shot back, now, Mr. Murray... If you don't want others to mention your dressy appearance, you should not always be referring to yourself and your clothes. You seem to take a great pride in holding up your $8 rubber boots with pants inside bootlegs. I have heard several men speak of Mr. Murray making a display of his clothes. American politicians' clothes have long been a matter of public debate, from John Fetterman's hoodie back to Lincoln's stoke by Pat, so there's nothing new about speculating on what clothes reveal of character. But what we see with Roger's alfalfa doolittle is how very little character may be concealed by a politician's costume. Speaking of deficiencies of character, my own, I have only time enough here to note that far too cursorily, that the first two films really go out of their way to make a couple of very cheap racist anti-black jokes uh, that I'll discuss on the page, but don't have time to delve into here. By declining to ever stand for office, Roger seemed to know that Pablum didn't make for viable policy. But on the whole, his work suggests an abiding skepticism vis-a-vis -vis the state, and I'd argue it's one widely shared by natives in Oklahoma, who combined conservative rural mistrust of government's assurances of benevolence and honesty with a deep understanding of a litany of historical wrongs. Over and again, Rogers caricatures um, American civic life itself as a farce, with politicians as the ultimate clowns. Politically, the formulaic Doolittle films are relatively toothless, but they signal, maybe, an epistemic shift towards democratized rejection of old ways of doing things, including class privilege, staunch as opposed to casual racism, and deference especially to elected officials' posturing. In particular, the question of who, that is, from where with what identity is empowered to amount an effective political critique is crucially reconfigured with Rogers. The alfalfas get ridiculed for the clodhopper's lack of refinement and a not too literal read respond by adopting a sense of hillbilly superiority. wherein the down-home ways are best and boots and a Stetson are all you need to stake a claim against the top hats and establish your political authority. In art, as in life, I fear. The reaction formation of hillbilly superiority, I like that phrase, um, may help explain some of the historical and contemporary contradictions of jerkwater politicians. 
Tired of people not taking your ideas seriously and making fun of your clothes? Roll up your constitution and take it to Bolivia. Or maybe to the conceptual area of states' rights, where your authority will neither be questioned nor ridiculed. Oklahomans on the national scene have long appeared at least as buffoonish as the alfalfas. Perhaps unable to, dis to distinguish good attention from bad, or just desperate for it, Oklahoma's U.S. Senator Mark Wayne Mullen recently had to be reprimanded and dissuaded from engaging in a fistfight with the head of the Teamsters Union on the floor of a committee hearing, offering, quote, well, stand your butt up then, into the official record of the proceedings. To whatever extent Rogers heralded a historical shift, some conditions stay pretty much the same, such as how second-class citizens get treated and created. Statehood for Oklahoma works much like citizenship for natives. The U.S. gets to appear magnanimous, but Oklahoma and its slack-jawed yokel legislators <laughs> never have very much say, while the U.S. gets full access to its resources. Oil, land, lives. We might have to pay off a hayseed or two with a cushy job after their terms, but those, like the prunes that the locals pilfer in going to Congress, are a dime a dozen. Also, like the prunes, they are loved by political walking eagles everywhere. Thanks. <laughs>